All right. Well, I guess we'll get started this evening. It's good to see you all here. We're going to 440. I'm sorry. I have the page number wrong. Please hold. Is it 49? 477. Not 49. Being led astray here. 477 in your hymn looks at Calvary. You see y'all here at Anchor Baptist Church. 477. Years I spent in vanity and pride. Hopefully that changed when you got saved. 477 at Calvary. Years I spent in vanity and pride. Caring not my Lord was crucified. Knowing not it was for me. Salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did spin at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Free pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burden so found Seated Brother Hanson. He's back. Yeah, some more of that Don uh, sausage. Okay, first Sunday of each month, door hanging. We need someone in that ministry. I'm not able to do that anymore. And the first Sunday of the month is going to be Debt Reduction Sunday. Um, we actually started this when we moved in the building here in an attempt to uh, reduce our mortgage and now faced with the um, uncertain climate of the monetary system that we have now, we could be paying an extra two or three thousand dollars a month. Not, not very hard to do that. Uh, second Sunday of the month is nursing home. Oh, back to debt reductions. First Sunday of the month has kind of always been that way, but we've just reiterated it now. And you know what? If you forgot it on the first Sunday and you want to add it to your tithe, we will know what it goes to. So. 
Uh, second Sunday is nursing home. That's with Wade. He's, he's going to be leading that up. Third Sunday of the month is street preaching. That's Ben. And the fourth Sunday of the month is choir practice. And the fifth Sunday we have sing-along. All right, Saturday, March 4th, that'll be this coming Saturday, Family Game and Movies. See Elise for just reading the, that's canceled. All right. All right, March 12th is nursing home and play practice, as we talked about. Uh, and that's it. We were... Uh, in 1987, I was going, no, 1990, I was going to Calvary Road Baptist Church, and there was a guy that I met there who was, who was the um, uh, building grounds guy. He fixed stuff, and he was in recovery. He got saved, and he was in recovery. And he went through Jerry Falwell's course, because that's a Jerry Falwell church. But anyway, he's, he's down in... Um, North Carolina. Chris and I drove 80 miles. I hadn't seen George in 10 years. He now has a little church. It's a storefront. That's my kind of stuff, but when he walked in there, it was like a bar. Lights were dark. The music was loud. And the preacher standing up there in tennis shoes. And he didn't preach the kind of stuff we're used to hearing. I'm, I'm just saying that because you know well, when we're doing wrong, we know we're doing wrong. But when I'm in the wrong place, I knew I was in the it's just um, that the place is called Point Church, and uh, they're struggling. I think if they got on the book, they would be all right. But anyway, uh, salvation. Did anybody witness to anybody? Yes, ma'am. That's the biggest source of practice material you'll ever come across. And it always happens at dinner time. If they call you, well, you know, because they figure everybody's going to be home. But if, you, if you're worried about witnessing somebody, practice on them. They're going to hang up in about two or three minutes. So, you, you know, the better you get, I think, the longer you'll go. Um, on this salvation, Pastor uh, St. John's grandfather did pass away. So you can, uh, but he he said that he had an opportunity to uh, to speak with him, and he feels uh, feels comfortable with what the, his grandfather's response. Up here on Joe Curtis, Joe Curtis is a guy that I spoke to about a week or so ago. Um, when I was in rehab, cardio rehab, I met a guy who's a pastor. We were sitting out in front of this place at 5.30 in the morning waking, waiting for it to open up, and he starts witnessing to me. And, and so we've developed a friendship. His name is Bob Ellis. He was here in this church for Jack Slagle's funeral. He knows Phil and Jack very well. Anyway, we went to, went to breakfast over in Fredericksburg where they have the saltfish place out on, yeah. Yeah, and he knows everybody in Fred. He pastored there for 30-some years, so he's got heart problems. But we're going to get together with this guy, Joe Curtis, again. He came up and was talking, and, and I engaged him in a conversation. Got an opportunity to witness to him, but he's like most people. You know, they, don't, they won't, won't make that last step. So, uh, Sickness, anybody on sickness? Yes, sir.
All right, did you witness to him? Okay. Um, haven't been in the Automobile Association. That's a, that's a, a rough, rough trade. Yes, ma'am. There you go. Good deal. Yes. Vicky. Well, she still is if that's what she told you. Things haven't changed much. And her last name is Hampton. Hampton Ryman. Okay. I don't know where his church was, but it was it was not in Rochester. It was like the middle of nowhere. It was west of Rochester. And Rochester is just real close to the river crossing Canada, right? Yeah. So he was in the middle of nowhere. And um, I was thinking of something that you're, I heard. I can't remember what your dad said. I was thinking of Buck. When they, I left him too long on the phone there. I was going to mention something, but fleeting thought. Okay, we done with salvation? Okay, journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. You don't ask him, they ain't coming. All right, sickness. Where's Betty? Is she on her way back? Okay.
Okay. All right. Um, right here, we've got Aaron, Julie's brother on dialysis. George Day stroke, is that correct? All right, and then we've got your brother, uh, Butch. He had surgery, correct? And now he's, he's got dementia issues. Is, is that the same brother? Donnie. Oh, I am sorry. You, what's your brother's name? Do you need to pray for him? Your brother's name, David. Okay, we're always talking about your, your father. I thought that was... I'm sorry. Sound man turned this up. Somebody might hear. I'm sorry that you couldn't hear me. I was. I thought this was your brother, Dave, not Butch is your dad. I apologize. Okay. Um... Anybody else for sickness? Yes, ma'am. Just two? He was telling me. Telling me. You know, we laugh, but uh, I worked with a guy who made 900 $71,000 a year had a hospitalization plan. You know what he died from? An infected tooth because he wouldn't go to the dentist. Teeth kill more people than you think. So, um, How about others? Okay. Ladies with child. We're getting close, aren't we? Four weeks? Your life is going to change. All right, unspoken. One, two, three. All righty. Work situation. You still looking for employees? Join the rest of the world. You need to put up a sign. This guy filled his roster. It's a pizza place. Stupid people need not apply. He's got, he's got enough people. So... Um, on the road, Howard's now in Louisiana eating the gumbo. Micah and Christiana Murr, they're in Israel. Okay. Yes, sir. Do you want to give us their names or do we just want to? Yogi? All righty. Anybody have anything else? Hey, brother. Yes, ma'am. Say that last part again. Okay. All righty. Okay. Remember the upcoming events? Um, Jason, will you pray over the prayer list and pray for the pastors?
205. 205, New Hampshire versus Eden, once for all. 205, free from the law, oh, happy condition. What is a happy condition to be free from the law? You get through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy in your Bible reading. It's nice to not be under the law. 205, once for all. From the law, oh, happy condition, Jesus has led, and there is remission, cursed by the law and bruised by the fall, grace hath redeemed. Amen. Thank you. 
Okay. Amen. So, So, sister, this is actually what I'm preaching on tonight. So we're going to kick right off into that. (laughs) But yes. Um, I, Christians, Christians, we are family. And family, I was, somebody told me this one time, family fights, but you're family. And at the end of the day, blood is thicker than water. And there, uh, I was listening to somebody preach the other day. He said, man, you get into the South, and family is king. Family runs churches. Family runs governments, family runs businesses, family runs everything. They will lie for you, they will go to prison for you, they will put other people in prison, thank you brother, for you, because that's what family does. We are related more closely through Jesus Christ than they are through birth. So, if you've got something, scripturally you ought to get it fixed. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, this evening. First Corinthians chapter 1. Look down in verse 26. There is... There was a, a great basketball coach, and I don't have his name, uh, but he was a college basketball coach, and he had a lot of championship belt, uh, championships under his belt. He was known for getting his team into the Final Four, and they asked him, they said, what do you do? How do you, how do, you do so well consistently? One-hit wonders happen, but consistency isn't an accident. It's never an accident. How does that happen? And he said, every year, when I get a new team in, and I get new kids in, I start with the basics. I teach them how to tie their shoes. Now, everybody knows how to tie their shoes. Everybody in this room, I'm pretty sure, knows how to tie their shoes. 
It said that if you tie your shoes wrong in a basketball game, and you run on your shoes wrong, and you mess your ankles up and you give yourself a blister, you're going to be out because your blister healed because you can't run right. She says, so I start every team, every year, with the basics. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, let's look down in verse 26. For ye see, we see your calling, brethren, how that not many mighty... How, see, I'm going to start off wrong already. Verse 26, for ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But if him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. A little bit of backstory: when Paul writes 1 Corinthians, he goes to the church at Corinth. He is coming hot out of Athens. Now, if you know the book of Acts, when Paul comes out of Athens, he's going to the marketplace, and he's debating. He's going to the marketplace, and he's debating. And he's going to the marketplace, and he's debating. And if you know your history, you know that all of these great Greek philosophers come out of Athens, and you've got Plato and Socrates and all of those people. They're all just a mess. And it says about the people in Athens, they want nothing better than to say or to tell some new thing. What's going on? I've got to find out what's going on to be the first person to tell everybody else what's going on. And Paul, when he leaves Athens, doesn't leave behind a really big, mighty work with a bunch of people in it. He says, I saw this person saved and that person saved, a couple others, and if there be anybody else, I don't really remember because not much happened in Athens. And then he goes to Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. He is sick and tired of big, long, 50-cent words and eloquent soliloquies declaring your personal philosophy and lived truth. He is sick and tired of it. He says, what I want to preach at Corinth, I want to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's it. So let's pray and we'll get started this evening. Lord, God, we love you, God. We're thankful, Lord, that you sent Jesus Christ to die for us and to fix us and to save us, God, from hell. God, thank you for forgiving us and helping us and walking with us, God, and calling us to walk more worthy than we are and to, to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. I pray you'd help us as Christians to do that, Lord. I pray that you would walk in these aisles tonight. I pray that you would have your hand on this church, have your hand on me as I preach, Lord, that it would be everything you'd have me to preach and nothing more and nothing less. I pray that it would be a, a help to the hearts of the people here, Lord, that we might draw nearer to you and serve you better. In Jesus' name, amen. When Paul gets to Corinth, he is so sick and tired of the mess he's put up with at Athens. He just wants simple people to give him a simple message and see people saved. He's done with the mess. And that's why when you read your Bible, there's no first Athenians and second Athenians. Because he didn't get a good work going there because they're all stuck on themselves. They're what are they? They're a bunch of unregenerate sinners. Living like a bunch of unregenerate sinners. You can't do much with that. But Christians, regenerate Christians, we're supposed to be changed. We're supposed to present our bodies of a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God, for this is your reasonable service. You're supposed to give of yourself to Jesus Christ to become the man, woman, child, teenager, older person, whatever it is that he would have you to be. And look down in verse, uh, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 says, And I, brethren, cannot speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal even as unto babes in Christ. And he gets there and he says, look, I've got to speak to you as babes. And he's preaching just the gospel. He's just preaching the basics. Why? Because they're young Christians. But keep reading. 
I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither, now, neither yet now are ye able. Everybody likes the meat in the body of Christ. You want to get into gap. You want to get into uh, Calvinism versus Armenianism. You want to get into uh, three-and-a-half-year trib, seven-year trib. Uh, the mid-year trip, uh, where's your, where are your three raptures? Yes, good stuff. You should know it. It's good for you. But it's not good for you until you mature. There are actually no great preachers that I agree with on every point. I was at uh, Pastor, Black's, uh, Pastor David Black's church Sunday night, listened to Brother St. John preach. I have had several lengthy, in-depth conversations with Brother St. John about doctrines that we disagree on. There's at least three. <laughs> What are they? They're the finer meats of the Christian walk. And what can I do? I can disagree with him on the finer points of doctrine and still walk in fellowship with him because that man is probably a better Christian than I'll ever be. Brother Tim Black and I have had some wonderful, in-depth, controversial discussions about doctrines. Why? Because you get into the meatier aspects of the Bible and you're trying to figure out how to walk with God and know these, these in-depth things hidden in the scriptures, which there are in-depth things hidden in the scriptures, which as a mature Christian will sustain you, but you can't feed that to babes. You can only preach and teach and do the basics when you're dealing with babes. Verse 3, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? It is completely natural to disagree with people. It is completely natural to not like people. Um, I've learned something. I've learned that pastor has a lot more grace than I have. But you're supposed to grow in grace. You're supposed to grow in your ability to understand the word of God, to administer it to other people, to have a sincere desire to see them grow, and to shake off stuff. Uh, I have had my own issues with people on my own that I have not had a lot of grace with. Nobody in this room, probably nobody that will ever come back into this room for that matter. And could I have had more grace? Yeah, I could have had more grace. Did I say anything that wasn't truthful? No. Nope. Did I say anything that was with a bad heart? No. No but it wasn't ministering to a babe the way that a babe needed to be ministered to. And I remember Dr. Peacock giving this illustration. He says, he says when he was a young preacher, he was fire and brimstone all the time. And he had some young Christians in his church that he drove out. And he talks about, what did you do? He says, you, it's, you people get up here, you hear somebody say, oh, preach the fire, preach the, preach the, I tell pastor all the time, preach the paint off the walls. Skin us. Nail, nail, you know, Margay, he, Brother Margay, he's coming. He's going to nail your hide to the wall. Bless God, it's going to be great. And you ought to like good heart preaching. It's good for you. Uh, but it's not always what you always need all the time. And he said he, people had gone in, they got into feelings hurt, and he drove them out. And God, he said God worked on his heart. He said, hey, I dropped some lambs off here a little while ago that needed some nourishment. They didn't need to be sheared. He said, and that broke his heart. He keeps a lambskin in his office to remind himself of that. But some people are just babes, and they need to be ministered to. How do you minister to babes? You have a lot of grace with them. Oh, and having grace is not easy. Having grace is easy when other people need to have it. They need to have some grace with me. You need to have more grace with them. To live above with the saints in love, oh, won't that be glory. But to live below with the saints we know, now, that's a different story. It ain't easy, but Paul said, I got to stick to the basics with you, Corinthians, because y'all can't get it together. There's strife, there's envy, there's division. All right, preach to yourself. Well, other people, all right, have more grace with them. That's all I can tell you, have more grace with them. Say, so you know what? Consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Why? Lest you be weary and faint in your own minds. I'm ready to just give up. I'm done. I can't handle this. Well, Jesus Christ put up with a lot more than I put up with. And that's easy to remember, or it's easy to forget, I should say, that Jesus puts up with a lot more from me than I put up with from other people. 
there's things I look at and say, how come I haven't grown past this? I've been saved for a long time now. I've been saved for 17 years now. How come I haven't fixed this yet? How come I don't know this yet? And every time I screw up and I take it back to God and say, God, I'm sorry. I am a piece of garbage. I screwed this up again. He forgives me. And the things that I am worried, that God has decided I'm not mature enough spiritually to handle yet, God has said, well, he still hasn't fixed this, but I can't convict him over because he can't handle it. You think about when you first got saved. Even to get to where you are now, if you had to take that, if the first step was from where you were when you got saved to where you are now, could you make that step? All right, you're going to have to get rid of your whole wardrobe. You're going to have to throw, up every, throw out every last piece of music you've ever bought. You're going to have to give up every single Sunday and Wednesday night to be at church. You're going to have to give 10% of all your money at least to God. 10%? Are you mad? If you went from there, from, from lost in your sins on the world, got saved, okay, first step. Maybe you better never put on a pair of pants ever. You better burn every pair of pants you got. You better give 10% of everything you have. You backdate. You back pay God. Hold on. Whoa. And what does God do? He waits and helps you grow with time. Well, if you think about where you were to where you are, think about how much further you got to go. How much further, and what does God do? God puts up with us. He doesn't bring down the hammer every time we mess up being not 100% perfect. God says, hey, this is your next step. You need to work on this. Spend too much time there, he's going to start getting out the stick. Say, hey, you need to grow, you need to grow, you need to grow, you need to grow, and he'll put up with you a lot more than you, than you would put up with anybody else. So much more. I learned how little grace I have. There are times where I'm sitting there and I think, God, there have been times I've been sitting here and I say, God, you give me the okay, I will take their head off this road. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. I can walk up and dress a person down perfectly scripturally accurately. Take them to pieces. God says, no, they can't handle it. Don't kill them. That's my kid. Don't forget that. Don't ever forget that. Whatever it is you're going to say, you're about to say to somebody that is God's child. And in, I don't have kids yet. We got eight months. We got one on the way. Um, the, the paternal instincts are, are kicking in. All right. I, and I'm, I'm starting to, the stuff is starting to line up in my head. And I know, like, hey, that's my kid. That's, that's my daughter back there. That is my child. Please don't get her sick. If you do, if I got to grab you by the ear and pull you away, no, you can't hold my baby. You have a cough. And that's just me with my child. But what about God with his child? God, I would, I'm, I'm about done. I don't want to see this. I'm gonna, and God says, that's my daughter. That's my son. Be careful. Do they need help? Yes, they need help. Okay, if you see that they need help, Christian, and you're strong enough to help them, you ought to be helping them, not grinding them into the dirt. Basics, basics, basics. Job 23. Job chapter 23. I've said this before, you will never beat the basics of Christianity. You will never get to the point where you don't have to do the certain things right. There are things you must always do as a Christian. If you want to grow, if you want to change, you want to see God move, you want this, okay. There's a couple things you have got to do. You are a saved person now. You have a living spirit inside of you. You have got to feed that spirit. You have got to feed the inner man. You have got to feed the Spirit of God inside of you. Why? To help it grow. How do you do that? Job chapter 23, verse 10. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot hath he held in his steps. His way have I kept and not declined. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. And we talked about that uh, on Sunday morning. Uh, it's the inspired scripture are the words of God's mouth. Job said, that is more important to me than eating on a daily basis. When it comes down to the choice, do I need to eat or do I need to read my Bible? You need to read your Bible. It sustains you. You become weak without it. 
You'll never lose your salvation. You're never going to die, but you will get weak. And there have been times I've missed Bible reading two, three, four days in a row, and boy, that starts to wear. And you realize it, and you say, you know what? Why am I? I'm in a bad mood, and I'm wicked right now because I haven't read my Bible, okay? I need to go read my Bible, and then we can talk, and then I'll be nice to you. You know, think, oh, ask the people around you. I, man, you learn things when you get married. You learn what you're like to live with. You learn what you're like to live with. And you learn that when you get backslid, your spouse can tell. They know. And you say, we, all, we are all wonderful in our own minds. But you say, you know what? Have I, been, have I been short recently? Have I been in a bad mood? Have I been mean? Hey, it, it, is something wrong? And I say, yeah. And you say, I know what that's coming from. Why? I haven't eaten. You're spiritually hangry. I didn't think I was going to use that phrase tonight, but you're spiritually hangry. You haven't eaten. Sometimes you just say, I just need to go eat. I just need to get my nose in this Bible and get sustained. Why? Because you get spiritually hangry, you get a bad spirit, and you start taking that bad spirit out on other people. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. That's how important these words are. They are the basics. You are not going to grow. You're not even going to be pleasant to be around as a Christian unless you are in this word. But it's more than just being in this word. This word has got to get inside of you. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. You are not going to live spiritually without getting the words that come out of the mouth of God. You say, well, I've already read the Bible. Read it again. You don't say, I already ate. I don't need to eat anymore. Eat every day. Eat a couple times a day. What do you want to do? When you, go to, when you want to build muscle... If you want to go to the gym and you want to get stronger, you want to build muscle, what do you got to do? You got to eat. You can go to the gym and work yourself until you puke, till you pass out, till you sweat all, until you stop sweating. But if you don't go home and eat some protein, you're never going to build muscle. That's why a lot of people never grow. They never get bigger. They're not eating right. You have got to eat to grow. You have got to eat to build muscle. Uh, there's an old phrase, abs are made in the kitchen. You want to get rid of all that excess fat? you got to eat right. You can work out your stomach muscles from here to the day you die, but if you don't eat right, you are never going to have abs. You cannot outwork a bad diet, and you cannot out-diet a bad workout. You can't do it. Either way, you need both. But you've got to say, these words... These words are important. You've got to say, you know what? I realize that this is important. Well, you say, well, I, it, it doesn't really. Know it. Sometimes you just got to go off what you know as a Christian. I know this is the right thing to do. It doesn't feel like the right thing to do. It's not what I want to do. But the Bible says do this, so I'm just going to do it because I know it's right. All right, do that. God will straighten out your heart. You do what you know you're supposed to do, and God will work on your heart. There's things I say, why do you pass it? Sometimes you just pass it on a track because you know it's the right thing to do. Sometimes you come to church because you know if you don't go to church that maybe someone's going to say something, someone's going to see something, that this, that, and the other. If I don't go to church, well, you know, someone's like, well, why aren't you in church? And you just go to church. And then usually that's when you get a blessing. Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel was a fascinating prophet. Ezekiel did some wild things, but Ezekiel committed himself to God. God told him to do that, these things, and he did it, and boy, God blessed him for what he did. Ezekiel chapter 3, this is early on in his ministry. Chapter 3, verse 1, Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest. Eat this roll, and go and speak it to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. This is weird. All right, you want a good sermon? Yeah. Okay, pastor walks up to me before church with a sermon book. Okay, eat this sermon book. And start chewing on it. Verse 3, And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I will give thee. Then did I eat it, 
and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. That roll comes in pipe as the word of God. You have got to put that word into you and got to put it into your bowels. You don't just chew it up and spit it out. You don't just read your nice little morning devotion and move on with your life. You don't just look at the pictures of the mountains behind the verse. Okay, I, I have a, I put uh, a Bible verse in front of some mountains on my Instagram feed. I'm spiritual for today. No, <laughs> that's not how it works. What do you do? You take those words and you put them inside of you. You read them. You can't put them inside you without reading them. And then what? You digest them. You think about them. And when you read your Bible, it starts out sweet. And then down in 14, verse 14, so the spirit lifted me up and took me away. And I went in bitterness and the heat of my spirit. But the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. He's got God's hand strong on him. But man, he's bitter. He said, something inside me has made me not feel good. Go to Revelation chapter 10. He says, man, I ate that. And it, ooh, man, something, something didn't set right. You put that book inside of you, it won't sit right all the time. That book will tell you things that you have learned to not be true. Well, God, I saw this, and that didn't happen. God, you'd say do it this way, but I did it this way, and it didn't turn out right. God, you all say we ought to be like this, but I think we ought to be like this. And God will say, are you going to believe my words, or are you not going to believe my words? Are you going to throw them up, throw them out, get rid of them, drop them in the trash can, take them out? to the curb, let them go, or are you going to keep them inside of you and let them make you bitter against yourself? John, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 10, verse 9, and I went unto the angel and said unto him, give me a, uh, the little book, and he said to me, take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth as sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. He puts those words inside, and when they make him bitter and they make him realize the kind of man that he is, the kind of world that he's living in, verse 11, and he said to me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. He says, all right, now that you've dealt with that bitterness, you've dealt with that, man, I am an unclean man. What am I? Good night. God can even use me? God, you don't know how many times I've gotten out of this pulpit and said, God, I don't know how you did anything with that, but thank you if anything gets done. I'm a mess. I always have been a mess. You can put a suit on me, I'm still a mess. I look at me and how I am and just, what? How does God do anything with this? But he does. I thank God that he does. But what does he do? The only the time that God gets anything done is when I minister out of this word, because I wouldn't be the man I am without this. I was uh, talking to a guy, and we were joking back and forth about it, about he went out to get his wife some coffee. And his wife said, don't do that. It's too much work. It's too much effort. I don't want you to have to go out and get coffee for me. Don't do it. It's no. Don't do it. And he had already bought the coffee. No, don't get me coffee. He says, well, I want to get you. No, don't get me coffee. I don't want you to get me coffee. You don't. Don't. No, just don't do it. I, it's, it's fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Get your wife coffee. <laughs> He comes home, she's not home, he puts the coffee on the counter, and he sends her a text, and he says, hey, I didn't get you coffee, but the Lord provided, and I just delivered it. He says, is that lying? I said, it's not, because if you were, and I, and I say this for myself, if I wasn't a Christian man, I wouldn't be a nice husband. He says, oh, you did something nice for me. I did something nice for you because God's worked on me to say, hey, you need to be nicer. It's not in my nature to be nice to everybody. I wasn't born with a lot of grace. I still don't have a lot of grace. Uh, it's, it takes, you got to grow in it. But you don't grow overnight. You take time and struggle and grit your teeth and bear it. It's like, God, I'm trying to do what you told me to do. And nobody else is doing it. But I'm going to do it. Because, all right, I'm going to listen to somebody tell me that I'm not doing something right. That I'm doing right. Say, okay, well, I understand that that's how you feel, and I disagree based on Scripture and Scripture and Scripture and Scripture and Scripture and Scripture, and here's another verse, but you still think I'm wrong. Okay. All right. Well, I'll pray for you because I'm not getting through your thick head. You don't think, oh, yeah. That's me. That's, that's Ben. That's, that's the flesh. What is it? It's just 
what that word gets in you, makes you bitter, and you're like, God, I need to be different. I'm trying to be different. Help me to be different. But you can't do that without this word. You can't do that without putting it in you every day and living off of it and chewing it and digesting it. Psalms 119. Go to Psalms 119. And I'm, I'm in a hurry. Psalms 119. This book is all about, or this chapter is all about the Word of God. It's a reference to the Word of God in every verse, all 176 verses. Verse 9, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways by reading the Bible through as many times as he can? No. By taking heed thereto according to thy word. The Bible says this, as much as lieth within you, dwell peaceably with all men. God, it doesn't lie within you. Okay, well, let me give you some grace to deal with this. That's not what I was looking for. Okay. Verse 10. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You've got to put it in there and get it to stick. You've got to memorize it. You've got to be able to pull those verses up from memory and say, well, the Bible says this, so I shouldn't do that. Verse tw- and stop looking for reasons to make Bible verses not apply and start looking for reasons to make them apply. If they don't apply and you bring them up in conversation, I will tell you. I am a... <laughs> I like, I rightly division I, is, is my thing. But I can probably give you a New Testament promise that's the equivalent of it, or its counterpart. Verse 12, Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in, uh, as, much as in all riches. I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. It's not just memorizing. It's understanding it and thinking about it and letting it work on you. Uh, I remember, uh, was, was, well, I'll skip that, but you have got to keep that word inside you and say, what does it mean? How does that word apply to my life? God, what are you trying to show me with what I've got from your word today? What do I need to do differently today that I wouldn't have done if I hadn't read this? What needs to change about me? Well, that's when you get into the personal walk with God, because that's when we get into to, to part two. Job, or I'm sorry, uh, go to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, verse 1. Jesus Christ is talking. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. And always to pray. Always to pray. You ought to be instant in season, out of season when it comes to praying. Uh, those emails come through. The texts come through. I get texts from people all the time. Hey, just found out so-and-so is sick and in the hospital. Hey, just found out so-and-so is this. What do you got to do? You got to get a hold of God on your own. If you can't get a hold of God on your own, then you're not doing them much good. I mean, and we all know, if something happened and your husband, wife, child, parent was in the hospital, you know who you'd text to pray because you know who would pray and you know who's got a hold on God. Uh, Contra-wise, I've talked about this several times, when David's son tries to stage a coup of the kingdom and put himself in instead of Solomon, he knows who to call to be sympathetic to his cause. He knows who will come with him to go against the king. So some of y'all are on lists of, I got some juicy gossip, I know who I'm going to tell. Some of you all are on lists of somebody's in trouble. I need to know that that person's going to pray. That's between you and God. But you are always to pray and not to faint. And boy, have I, I'm preach at myself with this. <laughs> ye have not because ye ask not. Ye have not because ye ask not. Let's just, just on that little thought, that little thought. Well, this is a, have you prayed about it? Well, I don't like this. Have you prayed about it? Has this person, well, I don't like that this is going on. Have you prayed about it? Have you prayed for it? Have you prayed for it? Anything that, listen, being discontented is natural. It happens. (laughs) Life isn't always perfect all the time. Okay, I'm not happy with this. Well, then pray for that. Pray for the person. Pray for the situation. Pray for everybody. You don't know how many times I've had something happen, and I go home, and I just pray for it all week long. God, this is going to be possible. 
oh, well, I know this is going to happen, and this is going to happen, and they're going to hate me, and this is going to be the worst, and then I get to church that Sunday, and I go to deal with it, and it's fine. You know how many times that happens? Why? Well, first off, if something happens, you don't deal with it in the heat of the moment. You go home, and you pray, and you pray, and you pray. About everything, everyone, every part of the situation you can think of. And you ask God to just, God, fix them, please. They're this, that, and then God goes, let's talk about you. Before we try and fix them, yeah, they need fixing. They need fixing. Yes, we'll, we'll get to them in a minute. We're going to put them over here, and we're going to talk about you. That's where the bitterness comes in. That's where those verses start popping in your mind. And you go, Wait a minute. Every word that I don't. Uh, every idle word that man shall speak, the same shall he give account of in the day of judgment. Well, there's some idle words in there. No. Well, in the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. Yeah, I, I guess, I guess I, but they have, I'm not, you're not praying for that. You're praying for you. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. That means that any issue you got, you take to God. If I have a problem, I don't take it to somebody else to take to God. I don't take, expect them to take something to me to take to God. You take it to God, okay? Yes, well, well, I got, I got to pray. I got to pray. Pastor, 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 God got his heart right, and that, that, that's the only way. No, you pray for you. You pray for you. You learn how to deal with you. You learn, hey, I have a shortcoming here. I always have, and I always will. So when we get to this part, I'm sorry, I'm going to struggle. That's confessing your faults one to another. <laughs> that's confessing your faults, saying, hey, I can't deal with that. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm, I'm not the right person for this job because I'm just. God didn't make me this way. God hasn't given me a gift to be like this. I, I'll be honest. I've prayed about taking over door knocking. I would love to do it. God won't let me do it. He won't let me do it. We got a vacancy. Somebody's got to fill it. I can put my hand on the Bible and say, I know to God that it's not me. He didn't put me in that gap. God said, I saw for me at the end of the gap, and I found none. I'm already in enough gaps, and I'm not filling them the way that I should. Uh, First Thessalonians chapter 5. You all know where I'm going with this. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Stick with the basics. Get in that Bible. Get that Bible into you. Let that Bible work on you. Let that Bible change you on a daily basis. Let it be your meat. Let it be your bread. Let it be your honey. Let it be everything that you need. Put that word above everything else. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. We all know that verse. We all know it. Boy, do we fall short on that. That doesn't mean you stay on your knees 24 hours a day. That means something comes to mind, you pray for it. You start thinking, let's talk about evil surmisings. <laughs> what's, the, what's an evil surmising? That's a, that's, a Bible, that's a biblical sin. Biblical Evil surmisings is where I know what's going to happen. I know exactly what's going to happen. They're going to come to church, and I'm going to sit down, and they're not going to sit next and they're going to go sit next to somebody else. And when they sit next to somebody else, they're going to tell somebody else what they, t- what they know about me. I know it. I know them. That's all they do. All they do all the time is they come to church, and they sit down with other people, and they tell them all the stuff about me. I know what it is. I know exactly what they're going to do. Evil surmising is when you assume another person is going to sin. And guilty as charged. You don't know how many times I've been punched in the face in my brain. Oh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a great martyr in my own head. We all are. Y'all, you get in your, I'm going to preach at this point. I, I, what is that? That's evil surmisings. And then God goes, hey, have you prayed for them? No. All right, well, let's throw out the garbage that never happens. And start praying for them. You start thinking, oh, well, this is going to happen. I know this is going to happen. And when it happens, we're just not going to have enough people. And we're going to have to shut the whole thing down. It's not going to work because it's not going to work. Um, what is it? John Wesley said, worry is a mild form of atheism. You believe that God is not able to sustain the situation, or you believe that God does not want, or God wants a different outcome. Well, I, want, I, I thought God was supposed to do this. I preached on that frustration. Well, I was going to do this, and then God was going to do this. That's not necessarily how God works. Elijah, yeah, you preached the best message that could possibly be preached. You did the greatest sign in front of the most people, and no one got right. That's not your fault. You let me work. You let me do my thing, okay? You get out of the way and let me do my thing. But God, they should have repented. I'm not any better than my fathers. 
No, you're much better than your fathers, actually. You're one of the greatest prophets in the entire Bible. Top two, Moses and Elijah. Top two. That's who he calls back in during the tribulation. Moses and Elijah. And Elijah thinks what? He thinks he's the worst prophet that's walked on the face of the planet. Why? Because things didn't go the way that he thought they were supposed to go, and he got frustrated. It's not always going to go the way that you think it should go. But, God, I did what I was supposed to do. It's in your hands. I'm going to pray and pray and pray and pray and pray. And if you choose uh, the Blunk, I'll sing a song. Lord, don't move that mountain. Just give me strength to climb. For if you should move each mountain, I might grow weaker every climb. If you don't ever stress your faith, your faith is never going to grow. If you don't ever stretch your grace, your grace is never going to grow. If you don't ever stretch your walk with God, your walk with God is never going to grow. If you don't ever put that in front of you, it'll never change you. You say, well, I know the Bible says this, but all right, go ahead. God will let you go your way. He'll call you. He'll try and pull you back. He loves you. He cares about you, but he's not going to force you to do anything. Boy, have I learned that. God does not force you to do anything. I can't force anybody else to do anything. What can I do? I can say, thus saith the scriptures, and that's it. I can tell you this is what the word of God says about it, and that's it. I can pray for y'all, and that's it. I can read my Bible and try and live it as best I can. I've run into situations where I don't know what to do. I've got to run all the references on that to figure out what I should be doing scripturally and what I shouldn't be doing scripturally because I don't know. I don't have them all perfectly committed in my head to know exactly what I ought to do all the time. And really, truly knowing how to walk with God, and this is point three, I'm going I'm to cut it short, but the third part of that is walking with God. You walk with God, you'll feed that relationship, take that, those requests to God, and God will go with you wherever you go to witness how you ought to witness, to minister how you ought to minister, to serve how you ought to serve. You say, God, what do I want to do? And you do the best you can to not quench the Holy Spirit of God as you walk in your daily life. That is where real Christianity grows, is to walk. It's not in the, I was, I, we had a good service today. It's not in the, well, I went to visitation and this went well. It's not, we, it's, all right, we walked out of the church doors. Am I still walking with God? Because all good Christians do. You don't know the mess that goes on with good Christians. I was talking to Pastor Davis. He's the pastor of Tabernacle Baptist Church. He says he's got a family in this church, but they're the best and the worst Christians he's ever pastored at the same time. He caused me more trouble than anybody else, and they serve God more than anybody else. <laughs> he's tried to throw him out of his church a couple times. Loves them to death. Loves all of them to death. He says, but they're the best and they're the worst. There's why. Because there's no walk. There has to be a walk. You can't make it without a walk. Otherwise, you just end up blindly applying scriptures and standards to things and saying, I'm a good Christian because I do X, Y, and Z. No, you're a good Christian if you know God. Because we're in 2023, folks. There's not a lot of people standing outside offering sacrifices to idols. There's not a lot of people uh, marrying their father's wives. I haven't heard of that happen. Those are the examples given in the Bible. What does that mean? You've got to take that Bible and absorb it and know, how does this Bible apply in 2023? Because boy, does it. Boy, does that Bible apply in 23. You start reading that, and you think somebody wrote it yesterday when you get into some of these portions talking about uh, 1 Timothy 5 is a good one for that. You start reading about how people are in the last times. You go, my goodness. You start reading about Laodicea, uh, Revelation chapter 3. Yeah, that's true. And the more grounded you get in understanding how this world works and how that Bible works, you begin to see, man, this book is, is relevant, but it's not irrelevant on surface level. It was written in 1611, King's English. Fancy these thousand shouts in ways people don't talk anymore. You, that Bible doesn't help you unless you apply it. You can hammer it. You can hammer it on other people. You can do whatever you're going to do. But it doesn't help you unless it goes into your belly and, lets, and becomes bitter. And you go, have mercy on me, O oh Lord. On me. It's me, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Man, those kids' songs are good. Not my mother, not my father, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. Neglect your Bible and forget to, shrink, uh, forget to pray, and you'll shrink, shrink, shrink. If it's doubtful, just don't do it. Man, those songs are good. Those songs will take you 
clear into adulthood, clear into spiritual maturity. Boy, it's, it's the basics. You've got to take the basics. You've got to live the basics. You've got to get down on your knees and pray for people, pray for situations, pray for things. I complained about there not being a lot of people in this church for a long time before I started praying about it. I don't know why, I mean, it's, I wish it would be nice if there were more people here. Man, it would be nice if there were more people here. I don't know if so-and-so's not coming anymore, and they moved out. And, I, and then God goes, how about you pray that more people start coming to church? Oh, oh that'd be good. Maybe I should pray for that. All right, because I'm complaining. For what? Take your complaint to God. David did that. He said, I'll pour out my complaint unto God. Complain to God. Don't complain to anybody else. All right? Chances are I already know. Chances are I already know. Chances are pastor already knows. Pray. Learn to pray. Learn to read that. Learn to not just, I, when I was a kid, and I, I'll close, but when I was a kid, when we would have prayer time, and I had the same prayer I prayed probably for years. Lord, thank you for mom and dad and brother that love me, and thank you for cats and dogs and horses and donkeys and this and that. And I pray that Aunt Jean, and Uncle, Aunt Jean and Uncle Jim and Aunt Bobby and Uncle Arthur and Aunt Patsy and Aunt Sue and Uncle Billy would all get saved. That's not praying. That was a good start for a babe in Christ, but that ain't praying. It's, God, please help us out. And it's spending time. Prayer is a labor. Prayer is work. Prayer is best done on your knees. You can pray anywhere, absolutely. I pray behind this pulpit while I'm preaching. But prayer is best done on your knees, alone, by yourself, without distraction, and say, Lord, help. And that flatters him. He loves that. You tell him, God, you can fix this situation. I'm going to have some faith. It, pray in faith, having faith that God will actually answer the prayer. You can pray all this, God, I pray to help this, but it ain't going to happen. Maybe, maybe it will. All right. If you don't have any faith, it's not going to happen. What? Basics. Pray. Read your Bible. Walk with God, and the rest will sort itself out. Let's pray. Lord, I try to do the best I can, God, to preach what you'd have me to preach, Lord. And I pray you bless your people. I pray you have your hand on your people, God. I pray you'd walk in these halls and help us as a church to know you, Lord. For everybody in this church, myself included, would grow deeper. I pray that we would understand your words better. I pray we'd grow in grace. Grow in love, grow in our, our, our desire to serve you, God, and our zeal to, to see you exalted, Lord, among the saints, among the heathen. God, I pray that we would live lives that are pleasing to you. We would do things, Lord, that matter to you in eternity, God. We minister and we'd serve as we ought to serve, God, in whatever our capacity is, whatever it is you'd have us to do, whoever it is you'd have us to be, God. Pray to help us to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ and consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest we be wearied and faint in our own minds, God. Please just have your hand on your people as we go our ways, God. Help us to never forget the basics, to never go past the basics, never forget, Lord, that it's, it's you and your word that sustain us, God, and nothing else. I pray you just guide every single person in this building in Jesus' name.